welcome all of you to the Hard Rock Summit. Uh, there should be more people in here. This is going to be an excellent talk. Uh, I'm Dale Gann. I'm the president of the Denver Gem and Mineral Council. Uh, we put on the DGMS portion of the show, and I want to thank the Hard Rock Summit for inviting us to participate in this. The first year of the Hard Rock Summit, and uh, you will see us back each year. But uh, again, thank you to the Hard Rock Summit for inviting us. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Jeff Scoville. Uh, and if you've ever opened a book or a magazine that's got pictures of mineral specimens in it, most likely some, if not all, were taken by this guy. And we are in for a treat today. Uh, he's gonna pull out his gazillion slides of fluorides from many of the best collections literally in the world. And uh, this is eye candy to the point where you'll need an insulin shot when we get done. So if you would, please give Jeff a warm welcome. First of all, just a little warning. There's going to be a tiny, a tiny little bit of mineralogy to start off this little program. Uh, don't get too scared. Don't go running out the door screaming. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be minimal. I'll just give you a little bit of background so it isn't going to be just pretty pictures. Um, fluorite is a very common mineral in the world. It's probably found on every, every continent in the world. Uh, I would imagine even Antarctica, though I don't, I've never heard of any crystals worth collecting from down under. Uh, from there. Down under, they get some nice fluorites, too. Um, uh, so that's a nice thing. It's not something relatively rare like rubies or, or uh, uh, even tourmaline, which isn't all that terribly rare. Um, but, and the nice thing, too, is it, it's not as expensive as a lot of minerals, so it's a little more collectible. The nice thing about it is, as the title of the program indicates, it occurs in every color of the rainbow. That uh, means it's allochromatic. That's the term meaning that it's a mineral that can occur in any color possible, as opposed to an idiochromatic mineral like sulfur, which is always yellow. It might be a yellow, orangey yellow, but it's always yellow. Um, anyway, so uh, numerous colors. The neat thing about it, too, is it occurs in a wide variety of crystal forms. It's not just one form. And uh, combinations of crystal forms. And the neat thing, too, is not just multiple colors, crystal forms, relative availability, and, um, and uh, not too horribly expensive. Oh, some of you may look at the prices out there and say Jeff was lying about that. Um, um, and it occurs with many other different minerals. So you can, instead of just having one little crystal that's loose in your hand, you can get it with all kinds of amazing associated minerals, and you'll see some of these as I go through the photographs. So um, it's a neat mineral to collect. It satisfies a lot of uh, uh, collectors' desires. Um, <clears throat> comes in all different sizes. You know, I've seen crystal, you know, from microscopic, less than a millimeter, to weighing hundreds of pounds. So uh, it's a little bit of something for everybody. Um, fluorite, oh, before I get into crystals, uh, fluorite, uh, has a lot of commercial uses. It's not just a pretty rock that, that people like to collect. It is, um, um, the basic composition is just two elements, calcium and fluorine, calcium fluoride, CAF2. And uh, it has a lot of commercial applications. Uh, almost everybody, I, I, I would hope everybody here brushes their teeth with some regularity. Uh, the fluoride that's in your toothpaste comes from fluorine in fluorite. Uh, we're sitting on chairs, which are partly made out of steel. All the steel and iron, uh, its production, its smelting, uh, is aided by a fluxing mineral called fluorite. And uh, it, the, the fluorine is also used for, uh, goes into hydrofluoric acid, which has many industrial applications. Uh, if anybody's into photography, you may have heard of fluorine lenses. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a fluorite that is, uh, or fluorite lenses, uh, that's included in the lens makeup because it's very low dispersion and helps create a sharper, clearer in image in your camera. Uh, Canon was well known for their fluorite lenses a number of years ago. It was a big selling point for them. Anyway, it has a lot of uses. Um, it actually, it, it's a very soft mineral. It's only four on Mohs hardness scale, 
which makes it pretty soft. You do see it uh, faceted, and uh, that's only for collectors of collector stones. You could not wear it in a ring or a, a necklace, a bracelet or something, because one little tap and it would probably break. So um, it's very pretty to cut and polish, but uh, you're not gonna wear it. Uh, you, also, you, you may have seen out of uh, China. China's producing an incredible amount of fluorite in recent years, and uh, they will often take the banded multicolored fluorite and carve them into bowls. Now, a bowl's fine if you're just gonna put it on the table and, may, and look at it or maybe put candy in it or something. Um, it'll, it'll deal with that uh, with no problem, and you're not gonna break it. Of course, if the dog knocks it off or something like that, the table, well, you're, that's tough luck. Um, <clears throat> some of me, you may be familiar with a, a term uh, uh, called Blue John. Anybody heard of Blue John? All right. Blue John is a word that uh, descri it, it, it's the name for a type of massive banded multicolored fluorite. It's usually kind of various shades of off-white to purple, occasionally blue. It's mined in England, and the name Blue John is a corruption of a French term, bleu jean, which, mean, which refers to the two colors that usually occur, occur, occurs in, alternating stripes of blue and yellow. So the English took that term and called it blue john. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, it was a very popular material back in the, late, in the mid 1800s, late 1800s for carving vases and things, the decorative objects out of. Uh, you're not gonna see much of it anymore. The mines in England have, been, have played out many years ago. Anyway, it's a really cool mineral. Uh, one of the things that makes it also, not just that it's uh, delicate and not usable for decorative purposes, aside from its low hardness of four, is it has a very easy, easy cleavage, which means it breaks in flat planes. And unlike a lot of minerals, it breaks in four different directions. So it's, it's, it's really problematic for people who do like to try and cut fluorite and make things out of it. It's a delicate process. You've got to really be careful cutting it. Um, anyway, and it's actually that, that, pro, that, that ability, uh, its cleavage uh, in four different directions makes it rather interesting. Southern Illinois uh, and going into Northwest Kentucky is one of the biggest fluorite, was one of the biggest fluorite mining areas in the world and certainly in the United States. And uh, they just mined tons and tons of fluorite, which went mostly for uh, smelting uh, flux and making steel. But uh, the miners, if they were bored, you could take massive pieces, and if you carefully broke it along the cleavage planes, you could produce octahedrons. That is two four-sided pyramids base to base. You can buy these things, they used to be by the thousands. You could buy them by, you know, flat after flat, just filled with these things, and they would just sit there with a hammer whacking these things out. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these things get sold as natural crystals, which they are not. They're portions of natural crystals, but the octahedrons that you see for sale as loose crystals, as loose crystals, are not crystals. They're crystalline, but they're not natural crystals. So don't get fooled. Uh, there's nothing wrong with buying one of them if you know that's what they are. Anyway, <clears throat> the neat thing about fluorite is it, is, uh, it belongs to what's called the isometric crystal system, which means the most simple form of which is a cube. And this is an example of uh, some of the crystal forms in the upper left. You will see there a basic, where is it? There it is, a cube. Now if you slice off all the corners until the slices meet, you get what's called an octahedron. Now if you take and slice off all the edges, you end up with a 12-sided form called a dodecahedron, which is the most common form you're gonna find garnets in, for instance. These other forms that you're looking at here are combinations of the first three. So right here, this one here is a cube, and you've just taken a little bit of the corners off, which is the octahedron face, and if you take a little bit more off, you get that, a little bit more off, you get, uh, oh, well, that's a dodecahedron, excuse me. Uh, anyway, not to get into this, the thing is that th they can get very complex, the crystals, because they can have combinations of these three basic forms and other basic forms, which we won't really get into. So here's your cube. And here's a cube of fluorite uh, from Yaogunshan Mine in Hunan, China. By the way, the guy who owns this, Jim Gable, has a display of his uh, fluorite collection. That's pretty much all he collects. And, it's out there somewhere, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, 
he has thousands upon thousands of fluorite specimens from all over the world. So, here we go. Cube, octahedron, has eight faces, two pyramids stuck base to base. And this is an example of several inter, uh, intergrown octahedral fluorite crystals from, uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact locality, but it's China somewhere. Also the Gable Collection. And here's the do dodecahedron, or as the Germans would call it, a rhombododecahedron, or a rhombic dodecahedron, because each of those faces is the shape of a rhom. And a cube and an octahedron. And we progress until the octahedron, it's mostly octahedron. And here we have the dodecahedron in, in yellow, which is basically slicing off the edges. Slice off a little bit more until they're about equal. And here you go. These are fluorites from uh, Fujian, China. And the, the more brightly lit faces are the cube faces. And the, the less lighted faces are the dodecahedron faces. And here we have a dodecahedron that just does a little trace of a cube left on it. These are really neat because, like uh, in this particular one here, you can see that the dodecahedron faces are a little frosty, but the cube faces are very gemmy and transparent. And if you could look inside that little cube face there, you can see the inside of that crystal is absolutely flawless and transparent. It's really pretty neat. This is from Dalnagorsk in eastern uh, Siberia. Uh, this is another form. Uh, if you can imagine that octahedron that we saw earlier, divide each of those triangular faces into three more faces, they call it a trapezohedron. This is also a common form for garnet. But you do find it occasionally in fluorite. And then here you take the cube faces and divide them into four, and it's called a tetrahexahedron. That sounds like a mouseful, but if you think about it, a cube is a hexahedron, which means a six-sided form. Tetra means that each of those faces is bro broken up into four. Tetra from uh, Latin meaning four. So there's four faces on a six-sided form. And uh, the combinations of all these uh, these different uh, forms can produce some very interesting crystals. There's the octahedron and the dodecahedron. And uh, same thing, but the dodecahedron is the dominant form. Now this is really cool because many years ago, and the people always ask me this, it says, do I collect? Well, I say, of course I collect. You think I'm, well, I want to be careful the next thing I say. Totally crazy? <laughs> of course. To be a part of this hobby and business, you do have to be crazy. It's, it's a requirement. But I started collecting when I was about eight years old, and I still collect and started uh, photographing minerals about 10 years after I graduated high school. Anyway, <clears throat> this is, uh, I, used to, I grew up in Connecticut. I was born in Denver. Yay, yay. Uh, <clears throat> moved to Connecticut. You know, when you're a kid, you haven't got much to say about what your parents are going to do. So uh, kicking and screaming, I moved to Connecticut. But I used to do a lot of collecting around Connecticut. And uh, there's a place called Old Mine Park. It used to be a tungsten mine in Trumbull, Connecticut. And I collected some really neat fluorite crystals years ago. So this is a little guy. It's only about a centimeter high. They don't get very big in this particular locality. But look at that. It's a combination of cube, dodecahedron, and octahedron. And interestingly enough, the color's concentrated just below the rather rough cube faces. Pretty neat. I was very happy when that thing just fell out and went right into my hand, pretty much. Fluoride also does something else, which a lot of minerals do, and that is called twinning. A crystal, or two crystals grow together in such a way that um, it's what we call a twin. Not, and this is the thing that confuses a lot of people. There's a lot of crystals that intergrow. They are not necessarily twins. There has to be a certain geometric, mathematic relationship between the two of them. So just because two crystals are growing together doesn't mean they're a twin. Anyway, in this particular case here, if you look at the octahedron on the left, if you draw a plane through it where you see the, the, uh, the dotted line right there, and if you slice that crystal apart right there and then rotated the halves relative to each other, you would get what you have on the right-hand side. This is what's called a spinel law twin. Fluoride does it quite often, and obviously it was named after the mineral spinel, which does it very frequently, so spinel law twin. So, Fluorite crystals do this rather frequently. This is one, and if the two, if the two sides are pretty much equal, and uh, they don't always grow so that it obviously looks like two, uh, two octahedrons intergrown, 
you get very flattened crystals like this group from uh, the Orongo Mountains in Namibia. So whenever you see a very flattened fluorite crystal, it very likely, not always, but it's very likely going to be a spell law twin. Um, sometimes fluorites produce what's called a penetration twin. And uh, it looks like two cubes that somehow were slammed together and uh, they're sticking out of each other. And that's a classic idealized example. And here's one from England. And uh, this is an interesting thing. If you look at the, uh, the crystals on here, the three largest ones, these three right here, are all, spinel, I mean, are all penetration twins. This is fluorite from the Roger Lee mine. And one of the cool things about fluorite is, does the name fluorite remind you of anything in your home? Fluorescent lights. Some of you are old enough to remember back in your high school days, maybe you had black light posters on the wall with your favorite rock groups, and you put the black light on them and they glowed. That's because they fluoresce. And fluorite fluoresces. That's how, I don't remember which way it went, whether the chicken came for, you know, the egg came first or the chicken. But <clears throat> one of them's named after the other. And I should know the difference, but uh, I've forgotten. I'll just blame it on old age. When you put a fluorescent, an ultraviolet light on a fluoride specimen, not all of them, but most of them fluoresce. This is the same specimen fluorescing under long wave ultraviolet light. It's a pretty cool thing. The color that they fluoresce varies. Purple is the most common, but you also get uh, blue and uh, variations thereof. Okay, now we're just gonna buzz through some really cool pictures of some outrageous fluorites from around the world. And we're gonna start alphabetically. And so, uh, here we go, Canada. One of the well-known localities in Canada is uh, Madoc, Ontario. This is, uh, it's a cube modified by an octahedron. If you were paying attention earlier, you would Recognize that. Um, by the way, there will be a quiz at the end of this program, okay? So you better run as soon as I finish, finish talking. Uh, another one that's quite well known, uh, further west in British Columbia is the Rock Candy Mine in Grand Forks. And uh, typically they produce octahedral green crystals on a nice contrasting snowy sparkly quartz matrix. China. China is producing incredible quantities of fluoride local, uh, specimens from hundreds of different localities. And uh, some of us, the, Ill, the, the fluoride mines in Illinois were the biggest producers in the United States for many, many years. Unfortunately, the quantity and the lower prices of fluoride from China has kind of helped uh, along with uh, the mines in Southern Illinois with their, their demise. Uh, they quit mining fluorite in Illinois. I can't remember what it is now, something like 20 years ago now or so. But uh, China is producing incredible fluorites. Uh, the Shangbao mine in Hunan is producing these gorgeous fluorites. They, uh, quite a variety of different colors through the years. It seems as the mining progresses, they go through different zones that produce different colors and crystal uh, forms. Same mine, Shangbao, different color. And here, Essentially, you're looking at a cube, but it's, it's made up of little tiny cubes that are stacked up in a way that it's actually produced very rough dodecahedral modifications on the, on the, uh, the crystal. And a beautiful uh, color. The crystals from here are just a beautiful shades, uh, pastel shades. Um, another place in China, this is Shangrao, not Shangbao, Shangrao, in a different province, uh, province Jiangxi. And uh, these are uh, clusters of green to purple octahedral crystals. Uh, one of the most prolific producers is uh, the Shanghua Pu mine. There's actually Shanghua Pu on one side of the mountain and Shanghua Lin on the other side. And the crystals from both of them look pretty similar. Um, uh, basically green cubes, sometimes with dodecahedral modifications such as you see here. Um, anyway, uh, Gorgeous, gorgeous material, and I imagine thousands and thousands of tons of this material have come out of this mine through the uh, years. Now, this is from the same mine. This is interesting. First generation are octahedral with a little sugar frosting on them, and then uh, a little bit like the one we saw from the Shangbao mine, a cube made up of stacked cubes, sort of producing a dodecahedral modification. Um, 
if you can read my uh, uh, the writing on the on, on the uh, on these slides, you'll notice that the uh, uh, I have a size always indicated, and uh, I use metric, 15.3 centimeters, which means it's about six inches across. And uh, anyway, uh, the Yao Gong Shan mine is amazing because. Uh, as we saw, the color on the ones from Shanghua Pu and Shanghua Lin are almost always some shade of green. Shanghua, I mean, in Yao Gong Shan, different crystal forms and many different colors. They're just gorgeous. Um, this is in the same province in Hunan. Uh, so here we have purple cubes with a little color zoning. Here are some cubes that only have purple on the corners. And these are solid purple, but with a very strange surface texture to the crystals. These are all from one mine. This is also from uh, Yagan Shan. And look at these sort of stacked cubes with dark zoning around uh, the edges of the cubes. So that's the neat thing about fluorite, too. It's a little bit like tourmaline. If you don't, you know, if, if you're not crazy about a, a crystals of a single color, collect ones that are all color zoned. Uh, so these are octahedral crystals from the Dayan mine in uh, Jiangxi province. And recently, there's a locality, there's a, a group of mines around Huanggang in Inner Mongolia that have been uh, producing amazing fluorites now for several years. And so these are octahedrons with a little bit of a cube modification on quartz. Uh, they're just gorgeous. This one here is just under four inches across. From the same locality. Just recently, within the last year and a half, they've been coming out with these amazing octahedral pink uh, fluorite crystals. This is from Bill Larson's collection. At 13.6 centimeters, that makes it a little over five inches. I haven't got the locality on this, and this is something, this is a caveat emptor. Buyer beware. The Chinese have discovered that some of these fluorites, which can be kind of pale in color, if they are irradiated, turn an incredible, gorgeous blue. So if you see really seriously blue fluorites from China, I would be very cautious because they very well have been irradiated. And this is probably one of them. England has amazing fluorite deposits north in, uh, the, in, the, uh, in Cumbria. And uh, one of the mines that's been operating uh, and producing incredible amount of minerals recently are crystals is the Roger Lee mine. A uh, great many of the crystals are twinned, as you can see the interpenetrating twins, twins here. And uh, they're almost always uh, various shades of green. Mostly this is the typical shade of green. And uh, the thing that's neat about them is they're extremely fluorescent. So if you held this specimen in your hand out in the bright sunlight, it would not be just green. It would have strange purpley blue overtones to it. And since I usually use flash for photographing minerals, um, the flash has a good bit of UV in it. So those shots are taken, uh, they have the bluish purple overtones. So in order to photograph these without the ultraviolet fluorescence, I have to use a, uh, a CFL, a compact fluorescent tube, which is daylight balanced, but without the UV in it. And then you can get a nice green. That's about the only thing I'm gonna say about photography here, okay? That's a whole different lecture. Uh, I told you about <clears throat> uh, faceted fluorite. This is one. It's kind of neat because it's got a little purplish color zoning in it right through the middle of the stone here. This is 25 carats from the uh, Cal and Carith Graber collection from the Roger Lee mine. From not too far away, a fam another famous mine is the Hilton mine. They're typically a, a beautiful yellow color, orange yellow. And uh, this is also from the Graber collection. Uh, not too far away is the Black Dean Mine, Graber Collection. Nice bit of uh, zoning, you know, a little bit of alternating purple striping in there. Um, all I have on this is the, uh, the county, County Durham, uh, Graber Collection. Just kind of neat because it's uh, growing on some very nice dolomite crystals. France has amazing fluorite deposits. The most valuable, the most sought after are the ones from the French Alps around the area of Mont Blanc. Uh, as far as I know, there are no actual fluorite and smoky quartz deposits on Mont Blanc itself, but in the adjacent mountains, there are incredible smoky quartzes, sometimes with beautiful octahedral um, 
fluorite perched on them. <clears throat> and uh, they're almost always some shade of pink to almost red. Uh, gorgeous piece here. This is a little under four inches across. This is a magnificent specimen in the collection of Barry Kitt and uh, uh, just over four inches wide. South central for France there are. Monsieur, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> we have a Frenchman walking and watching. He's going to give me grief about uh, my terrible French accent. <laughs> Um, anyway, South Central France, this is a, an amazing area and uh, in uh, the province of Tarn. And uh, the most famous, many different color fluorites come out of France, but the most amazing blue fluorites come out of three different mines. And the best known of them all is Le Bourg. And uh, they're the town of Alban. So uh, beautiful blue fluorites. This is all from the same mine. Sometimes they're very nicely zoned as you see with this one. Um, in the province of Ave, uh, in, uh, Aveyron, um, another famous locality is Valzerg. And Valzerg, they're typically kind of a honey yellow. But they also can have a wonderful color zoning. Usually the blue zone is just a thin layer on the surface, but once in a while, it's big enough to really see well. Uh, this is also happens to be, a, it's twinned. And this was field collected by a collector by the name of Michel Ambois. Germany has a lot of very fine fluorite localities. This is from the Beihilfe mine in Saxony, Germany, uh, a little less than four inches across. This is from the Bergmanisch Gluck mine in Saxony. Interesting colors. I mean, look at these things. Uh, the Pirle mine in Schwarzenberg in Saxony. Uh, nice orangey yellow crystals. And from the Frisch Gluck mine in Saxony. Interesting color combinations. From Halsbrucke in Freiburg, Saxony. And if we go over to the west side, Saxony is in eastern Germany and uh, up against the Polish, I mean, yeah, the Polish border. If you head west into the, the Black Forest, there are a lot of mines there, uh, most, most of them abandoned, with one notable exception. And uh, beautiful fluorites have come out of there. This is a bunch of stacked cubes with minor dodecahedral, dodecahedral modifications from the Artenberg Quarry in Steinbach. And this is the, uh, the state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, the crystal's not very big, it's a little less than one inch high, but it's quite a beauty. The still operating mine, as far as I know, is the Clara mine that's in the south end of the Black Forest and uh, in Oberwolfach. Um, the whole piece here is a little over five inches across. Just gorgeous crystals. The ones from here range all the way from colorless to pale to fairly rich blue. Um, I've only got one thing to show you from India, and it's the weirdest fluoride around. Maybe the weirdest. In the basalts, you've seen all the amazing zeolites that come out of these quarries. Uh, calcites, napophyllites, scolocytes, naturalites, uh, you name it. And uh, most famous is the Mahodri quarry, and, and uh, they're all, most of them are in the state of Maharashtra, which is uh, in the area of Mumbai, which used to be known as Bombay. And the fluorite there forms fibers that re radiate in tight masses to produce these hemispheres. And they range all the way from pale yellow, actually almost colorless to pale yellow, to a deep reddish orange, such as you see here. This one's kind of growing over a uh, calcite crystal on a bed of, uh, I'm not sure, I think they're quartz crystals. They're really pretty neat. Ireland. Ireland's not known for too many minerals, but uh, there's a granite quarry that has uh, been around for quite a while. And uh, a few years ago, they ran into a zone that's been producing some really interesting fluorides. Uh, it's Joe Lar Larkin's quarry, and I'm not sure I'm even going to try and pronounce the name of the town that it's in, in uh, County Galway. Um, this one is uh, about three and a half inches across. It's a cube modified by a dodecahedron with some very interesting color zoning in there. Same quarry, straight cube, neat, neat uh, color zoning. 
a cube modified by a dodec sitting on an octahedron. Strangely enough, green is not common there, but there's a green cube overgrown by pale purplish cubes, all nicely oriented on a surface. Italy, uh, the Alps extend all the way from southeast France to into Italy, uh, Switzerland, of course, and then into Austria and, and southern Germany and uh, Bavaria. Uh, so Italy has produced some beautiful pink octahedral fluorites, just like you see from just over the border uh, in, into France around uh, Mont Blanc. Well, of course, in Italy, it's not Mont Blanc. It is Monte Bianco, which means the same thing, White Mountain. Uh, but there are other fluorite localities in, uh, in Italy. This is from Sardinia, which is a rather large uh, island off the west coast of Italy in the uh, Mediterranean. This is from the, uh, the Perdonieda mine, and uh, a little over three inches high, beautiful green. In the Zogno mine in Lombardy, Lombardy, Italy, which is in the north, uh, these fluorites, which look an awful lot like some of the Chinese ones. And uh, down in Sicily, which is the big island off the toe of the boot of Italy. Uh, this is the Termini in Merese um, in uh, Monte, Monte San Calogero. Pretty neat. Kazakhstan. So unless you're in the military, a lot of people probably have no idea even where the heck Kazakhstan is. It's basically east, northeast of Afghanistan. And uh, it's got some really interesting mineral localities, but they include some fluoride localities. The best known of which is Karaoba in the Karaganda Oblast. Oblast is comparable to our state. And uh, this is atypical for the locality, uh, pale yellowish cube. Most of them look more like this, octahedral green crystals on this uh, frosty, smoky, uh, frosty quartz. Really pretty neat stuff. There's another locality I couldn't find a picture of on short notice where they are beautiful deep, oct uh, deep purple octahedral crystals with pale purple apatite crystals, and those are from uh, Akshatau. Uh, anyway, Madagascar. Madagascar is known for pegmatite minerals and a few other things, but not much in the way of fluorite. But a few years ago, they, someone found some really neat fluorites uh, in uh, Malimbandi. Um, this group is just under four inches high. Typically just green and cubes. Pretty simple. Mexico has many fine fluoride localities, but the best known of which is, uh, are the, the uh, lead and zinc mines of uh, Nica Chihuahua. So this is uh, a rather strange pale green crystal growing on sphalerite. This is the uh, same locality, but with uh, Galena. And these are Spinel Law twin flattened crystals from the same, you know, from the Nica mines. Morocco produces an uh, amazing number of different fine minerals, and uh, it has several very good fluorite localities. This is from the El Hammam mine in Meknes Prefecture. Nice, simple cubes. And uh, from the same mine, yellow cubes. And uh, not too far away, there's the uh, Hamada mine in Jorf. Um, I've actually been to this mine, went, literally went through a hundred flats of minerals to find one specimen I wanted for myself. Uh, but pretty neat, nicely a uh, zone, kind of yellow to a uh, darker yellow. And sometimes with blue centers, that's pretty cool zoning. And another locality that was just found a couple years ago, uh, the, they're calling it the fluorite quarry in Trorit. Nice cubes, a little bit of zoning. Namibia is producing some amazing fluorites recently. Uh, I wouldn't say recently, for, for a good while now, probably for 20 years. Anyway, these are from the Orongo Mountains, and uh, typically they're green, and uh, a combination of cube and dodecahedron. What's cool are these, what they call alien fluorites. And if, you, if I shot this from a lower angle and did not include the, gr the, the green square on the top, you'd know what I mean about an alien fluorite. One of them by uh, uh, the Van Pelts, a photograph by the Van Pelts was the, uh, was the Tucson poster maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago or so. But these are really cool, cool uh, specimens from there. And uh, there's a very famous fluorite mine called the Okoruso mine 
uh, in Namibia that produces these pretty crystals. You'll see these in druses where they're just solid crystals all interlocking and they're cut off the matrix and they actually kind of carve them out from the back so that there's no matrix. So when you backlight them, they just glow. They're just amazing specimens. Probably some for sale out there somewhere. Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is well known for its pegmatites way up in the north in the uh, Haramosh Mountains, just kind of the western end of the, uh, the Himalayas. <clears throat> and we're talking about associated minerals. You find fluorites from, uh, some of the best are from Chumar Bahur, associated on a muscovite mica and with aquamarines. This one here is probably the finest that came out of a particular pocket, pocket maybe uh, close to 20 years ago now. It's a penetration twinned octahedral crystal with really interesting color zoning. And uh, this is now in the MIM Museum in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, incredible specimen, just under six inches high. Peru has a lot of uh, metal mines for uh, lead and zinc, and uh, they produce some very fine crystals. They tend to be just octahedral and pink. Uh, sometimes this one has minor dodecahedral and uh, cube modifications on it. This was from a collector in uh, Spain. That's on pyrite, and another one on pyrite. Poland. In western Poland, in the, uh, the state of uh, the province of Silesia, um, they have granite. There's about 30, uh, approximately, I would say precisely, 39 granite quarries, which are operated for building stone, cobblestones, curbstones, and that sort of thing. And they hit pockets, just like the, the granites here in Colorado. And these pockets produce, uh, if I recall correctly, 60 different mineral species. Prominently, of course, smoky quartz, microcline and albite, but occasionally beautiful fluorite crystals. So these are octahedral purple fluorites from the, they all come from around the town of Stregom. This is specifically from the Borov quarry. Hmm, I missed a little uh, editing there. So nice purple ones on uh, albite, microcline, and with stilbite. This is some rather strange color zoning, looking right down the tip of one of these octahedral crystals from the Euro granite quarry, and a group of octahedra sitting on microcline feldspar, about five and a half inches high. Portugal, probably the best known locality in Portugal uh, are the mines around the Pan uh, Panasquera area in uh, Covilha, the state of uh, Barabaixa. Anyway, uh, generally they tend to be purple cubes, sometimes with parallel or, or these rough surfaces such as you see here. South Africa is known for a lot of superb minerals, and up in North Cape province, there is a locality that's known as uh, Rimbas Mak in the Kakamas district. And a number of years ago, probably about 20 years or so, it started producing incredible, beautiful octahedral green crystals. This is the largest single crystal I've seen so far. It's about four and a half inches high in the Steve Neely collection. They form lovely clusters sitting on quartz, that cluster is about two inches across. And uh, not too common, but there was a little while there where they were producing these rather strange ones, which are a combination of octahedron and cube. Russia has a number of very fine uh, localities. And uh, primarily they're coming out of the, um, the mines around Dalnagorsk in eastern Siberia. In, uh, the uh, Primorsky uh, Krai, um, they range all the way from these transparent colorless cubes to ones modified by a dodecahedron. And uh, when these first started coming out, maybe 30 years ago, they just blew people's minds. The incredible clarity, the beautiful pale green color. And some of these cubes could be, individual cubes could be seven, eight inches across. Uh, amazing things. This particular cluster is just over six inches across from the Barry Kit collection. Northern Spain, particularly around Oviedo in the province of Asturias, uh, there are numerous fluorite mines there that are famous and have been for a very, very long time. This is from uh, La Collada and uh, very typical. They're purple with dodecahedral modifications. 
the crystals can get quite large. They're often uh, on quartz, sometimes on calcite. Another one from uh, La Collada, interesting color zoning. Uh, different mine in La Collada, La, the La Viesca mine. Again, pretty much just cubes on this one, a little more transparent. Uh, same mine. David Ziga of Ziga Minerals is right out there. I don't know if he's got this one out there for you to drool on, but you can see uh, what kind of good is he has for sale. Probably the most famous mine is the Better Base mine, and, uh, uh, or Better Base, the like a Cabana mine, and they're typically cubic purple crystals on bladed barite, such as this one here. And this is another one. Usually slight dodecahedral modifications on, you know, slicing off those edges. Here's another one that's an Anna mine in Better Base. And uh, the Yamas mine uh, produces these pale, pale lavender crystals, minor modifications, and they often are very flattened. There's another one from the Yamas mine. And this is a form we did not talk about, but if you look at that, it looks like basically a cube, and each of the cube faces has been beveled into eight separate faces. Uh, from the Aurora mine in the same area, nice little purple cubes. Sweden, most of us don't think about fluorite from Sweden. Probably the most famous locality there produces gorgeous golden yellow calcite crystals, dog tooth habit, really long thin spikes. But out of the same mine, it's produced, and not Malmberget, uh, beautiful green octahedral crystals, usually associated with nice orangey yellow still bites, such as this one here. Uh, Scott Worski collection, he's, he's out there. I saw him running around. He's got a booth. I wouldn't bet on this one being out there for sale, though, so don't get your hopes up. <clears throat> Switzerland. Most famous for his pink octahedral crystals from the Alps. This one, the whole piece is just under four inches high. These are sitting on a smoky quartz. This is from Plangenstock in the Gürschner Alp. Um, when they're sitting on smoky quartz, they're just absolutely gorgeous and are some of the most sought after and expensive fluorites in the world. This is from Zingenstock. Uh, the crystal is about an um, inch and an eighth across the smoky quartz. I haven't got the specific location on this, but this is a gorgeous piece, just over six inches high from the Wayne Thompson collection. Octahedra again. Last but not least, the US of A. Arizona. Does fluorite come from Arizona? Must be really ugly, right? Nah, I don't think so. We're best known for, you know, sulfides and carbonates, azurites and malachites and things like that. But this is a rather strange, uh, there's a locality in southeast Arizona called the La Florita Dolcita Prospect in Cochise County, not too far from uh, the famous mines of Bisbee. And uh, these are kind of octahedra that are very curved. They don't have flat faces. The Germans call these Ochsenaugen, which means ox eyes. And uh, they do occur like this in a few localities in the world, but it's fairly rare. Another locality, this is the Jackpot Mine in Mojave County, which is western Arizona. Uh, rather strange zoned octahedral crystals. Dark purple octahedral crystals from the Santa Teresa Mountains in Graham County, again heading back to southeast Arizona. On uh, quartz, uh, it's about a little less than uh, four and a half inches high. Back to western Arizona, this is uh, the Homestake Mine, Mojave County. Uh, they're nearly all this pale, green, frosty, octahedral form from this locality. Connecticut. Well, you already saw this one. You get to see it again because I know you love it so much, or as much as I do. There's one other locality in uh, Connecticut that produced some pretty nice, strange, parallel-grown crystals called, uh, uh, what, was it, what was it called? It was a dam site. Oh, well, senior moment. Anyway. Fluorite is not a well-known mineral from our, uh, Connecticut, and occasionally you find octahedral crystals in some of the basalt quarries. 
Here's the big one for the U.S. Hundreds of mines that have produced fluorite crystals uh, for over 100 years in southeast Illinois, mostly in Hardin County, generally referred to as the Cave and Rock District, <clears throat> uh, about five inches high. This is from the Denton mine, from Jim Jake Gable collection. He's got an exhibit out there. The little yellow crystals are barite. Uh, we get blue crystals too. They don't occur just in France. Um, anyway, the Minerva Number One mine is one of the biggest producers. Another one from the Minerva mine. And the color zoning on some of these is amazing. Same mine, beautiful yellow. And something the fluorite does that's a little strange is it, it can get etched, naturally etched. Humans didn't do this. And the purple seems to be more resistant to etching than the yellow portion. So you'll find things like this. And like this one. This is one again, purple on the outside, yellow on the inside. This is associated with uh, kind of frothy barite. Again, just Hardin County somewhere. Um, sometimes they have bizarre inclusions in them. This one's got some strange kind of little veily looking things inside of it. This is from the, the Denton mine, uh, somewhere in Hardin County. That's a pretty neat one. What people love is getting these, uh, the ones with the intense color zoning in them. This is with uh, strontianite. And here's an extreme example of etching. Now this one is all yellow. Aside from the purple being resistant to edging, etching, the corners are also more resistant. So you'll find strange formations like these kind of pointy mushrooms. And sometimes the purple on fluoride can be so dark it almost looks black. This is from an old mine that hasn't been in operation for many, many years, the Hill-Ledford mine. And you get very pale ones. This is the Annabelle Lee mine on fluorite, I mean on sphalerite. Indiana has one major locality, the best known, is uh, the Maystone and Sand Quarry in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They're always this nice yellow with uh, pretty much just uh, cube form. New Mexico has many, many very fine localities. Some of the best are from around the Pine Canyon area. They're purple octahedra. Uh, down around Blanchard, uh, the Portalis mine produces these beautiful purple and blue cubes. I haven't got the exact locality on this, but that's pretty cool zoning. And this is back in the area of the, uh, the first octahedron we saw, kind of green going to purple, the surprise mine in Luna County. Ohio's got a few localities. Uh, one of the better known is the White Rock Quarry and Clay Center. And uh, this one, the, the fluorites occur on bladed celestine crystals. Almost always this lovely root beer brown color. This one's really strange. Sometimes they have a coating on them. It's thought to be a thin layer of hydrocarbon, and it produces some very bizarre metallic colors, sometimes in purple and blue, in this case kind of greenish going to a bronze. This is from the Charles Pfizer and Company Quarry in Gibsonburg. Now here, this is interesting. The first generation uh, was all blue, with a blue metallic coating, and then some larger crystals grew on it without the coating, and they're just plain old transparent, transparent purple cubes. Uh, same locality. This is the Auglaise Quarry in Junction uh, with kind of a strange metallic greenish coating on it. Tennessee is another famous locality. There are several mines uh, around, uh, not too far from Carthage in Smith County. Uh, the best known is the Elmwood Mine for producing amazing calcite crystals, possibly some of the best in the world. Uh, interesting sphalerite, strange snowball-like barite, but gorgeous, gorgeous fluorite, such as you see here. Uh, always cubes, usually a little on the rough side on the, on the surface, sometimes very gemmy and uh, transparent with uh, interesting zoning. This is from another one of the mines there. There's the Gordonsville mine. This is also Gordonsville on dolomite. And here's one where uh, it's very strange. You notice the corners tend to have less of the parallel growth than in the center of the crystals. And those are the areas that also tend to etch less.
This is back to the Gordonsville mine. It's on Spalarite. And this is an extreme, extreme example of the etching of the fluorites from there. They produce these rather strange things that are kind of like ice cream cones. And here's one. Uh, the outside of the crystal is actually facing away from us. We're looking at the etched interior of this crystal. Um, that's the end of the pretty pictures. And uh, if anybody has questions, if we got a little time, I haven't been keeping track of the time here, but less than an hour. That's amazing. Actually, didn't run over uh, over time. Um, anyway, that's about all I have to say. Uh, um, interestingly enough, there I didn't have any fluorides from Colorado. Well, you can gang up on me and beat me out in the hallway afterwards. But Colorado does produce some nice fluorites. Uh, the Sweet Home Mine, which is famous for its amazing um, rhodochrosites, occasionally produces some nice purple um, fluorites. And uh, the pigmatites down around Pikes Peak area um, produce some very nice fluorites occasionally, perched on smoky courses. And uh, there are other localities. Uh, there are some beautiful, beautiful fluorites. Boy, I'm going to have to... Uh, add some more fluorites to this talk. Uh, around the Silverton area, you get gorgeous green octahedral fluorites, uh, sometimes associated with um, rhodochrosite. So uh, we, Colorado's got gorgeous fluorites too. Can't believe I miss Colorado. Whatever. Anyway, thanks a lot for coming and putting up with me.